All right, turn to John chapter, well, 8. <laughs> I'll say it that way. But really, it's John chapter 7, verse 53 to 8, 11 that we'll be looking at. Scoot that back a bit, because I don't think that's actually helping. All right. Well, we're coming to a very interesting uh, passage of Scripture today. Uh, or maybe I should just say an interesting text. It's a very familiar story of a woman caught in adultery and brought before Jesus. But what makes this story interesting um, is the fact that it more than likely was not an original part of John's gospel. Along with the end of the gospel of Mark, verses 9 to 20, this is one of the longest New Testament texts that we have whose uh, authenticity is, well, questioned, really. Uh, if you look at the margins in your Bibles next to this passage, you're, you're probably going to see a little note that says something to the effect of the earliest and most reliable manuscripts don't have John 753 to 811, or in you brackets 753 to 811 as not in the original text. When we determine something as belonging in the original manuscript, there are two lines of evidence that we use. We look at the internal evidence, uh, the passage itself, and we look at the external testimony. We look at the, um, at the Greek text, the early versions, the church fathers. So we're going to take a little time this morning to look at the internal and external evidence here um, related to this passage, and then we'll go into, uh, into the text. If you look at what we've been studying thus far in, in John chapter 7, Jesus has been at a feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, it's a seven-day feast. We don't know exactly what day he arrived because he did go up in secret later. But we know he was there for the last day of the feast because that's what we looked at last week. On the last day of the feast, he made this amazing declaration about coming to him and drinking of him. If you look at the flow of what John has been doing, just just humor me for a moment. We ended in verse 52. If you were to skip 53 and verses 1 through 11 of chapter 8 and just go from the end of what we read last week to verse 12, it's very much like we've been reading. Jesus is at the feast. He says something. People argue and discuss. Jesus is at the feast. He says something. People argue and discuss, right? The Pharisees are back and forth. Um, And so look at verse 50. That's where you were last week. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of the life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Do you see what I mean? When you go straight on, it's clear he's talking to the same group of people. But this little incident, this little episode is just sort of wedged in here. It's just placed there. In fact, the word again in verse 12, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, implies continuity between the chapters. In addition, Jesus starts talking about being the light of the world there in verse 12. We talked about the importance of Jesus' statement about coming to him and and drinking of him because there was a a, a ceremonial outpouring of water ritual, right, that would take place at the feast. Well, I mentioned that one, but I didn't mention this one. There is actually a lamp lighting ceremony as well. So Jesus is referring to that as well, drawing from the feast that he is at. And so, again, in context, all that is taking place uh, during that period of time at the feast, but this little episode is sort of wedged in the middle of it. In addition to that, if Jesus is is saying what he says in verse 12 for the reason I think he's saying it, I think he is uh, making an allusion to an Old Testament passage. And it's Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 2, and I, I have it up here for you. It says this, Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first... He lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her. By the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of the death, upon them a light has shined. I think, possibly, that Jesus says that because he's using it as a rebuttal against what the Pharisees harshly said in verse 52. And that's where we ended last week. Look at it again. They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. 
Remember, Galilee, that's a bad place. It's a backwater region of full of Cretans. And uh, Nicodemus stands up for Jesus, and they sort of say, well, are you also from Galilee? That's where that, that Jesus has been doing his ministry. But Jesus says what he does in verse 12, possibly as an allusion to Isaiah 9, because the Gentiles had something special take place. They, they were walking in darkness, and they saw a great light because Jesus ministered there so long. So to be in Galilee was not such a bad thing after all. So it may be a rebuttal against that. Also, some of the manuscripts place it in different places. Different manuscripts show this account elsewhere. Some of them show it coming after verse 36 in chapter 7. So you can look at that. Verse 36 is when Jesus has just said he's going to go somewhere else and go where they can't find him. And then verse 36, what is this thing that he said? You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. And then it goes into this account of the adultery with the woman. Some of them have it placed after verse 44 in the passage. Some of them place it at the very end of the book of John. You get to verse 25 of chapter 21, and boom, you find this passage. You even find it in the book of Luke. You find it in an entirely different book, Luke chapter 21 after verse 38. So when you see a piece of scripture that is being kind of wedged and tossed around different places, that should alert you to something, right? Um, and so that's one of the reasons that its authenticity of being written by John is questioned. Also, the vocabulary and style of the story are not consistent with what John has been writing thus far. If you look at verse 3 of chapter 8, it says, Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Now, we're all used to that phrase, the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees. We, in our minds, always put them together. You probably haven't noticed, John never has. It's in your mind, if you're used to the Gospels, because you should be, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. Matthew, Mark, and Luke always say of the scribes and the Pharisees as they were a team of people. But nowhere does John put them together. Guess where the only place you see that in John is? Right here. Not something John has been doing. The passage, if you read it, suggests that Jesus spent the night on the Mount of Olives. Just ver look at verses 1 and 2. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. So there's an implication that he spent the night somewhere in the Mount of uh, Olives. Now the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do recall that, but they record that taking place during the Passion Week. That's still six months away. It's a different time frame. Now, of course, Jesus could have spent the night in the Mount of Olives at different times in his journeys to Jerusalem, and the Gospels just never recorded it. That could definitely be. But in addition to that, the synoptics refer to the Mount of Olives all through it, but John never does. Again, it's only referred to here in this section of, of John's Gospel. So there's those, the internal evidence, the internal things that we see, the passage jumping around in different places, some earlier in John, some in Luke, some later in John, um, the different um, vocabulary that's being used, uh, uh, those types of things lead us to believe that it's not part of John's original writing. That's internal evidence. External evidence, while the earliest and most reliable manuscripts omit it, you don't find it in the earliest ones that we have. Um, others that do include it, mark it. They've actually bracketed it to say this is questionable regarding its authenticity. Now, remember what I'm saying. I'm saying its authenticity in terms of it being written by John. None of the early Greek church fathers commented on this passage, even those who taught on John verse by verse. So we have verse by verse commentary, and they get here, and there is no account of this adulterous woman. This section is excluded. The first time... You see that in history is by a 12th century church father, and even when he does comment, he does acknowledge that the manuscripts don't contain the story, the earliest manuscripts. Now, some have theorized about this. Why, was, why has this happened? Maybe it was in the original, and some overzealous scribes went back and removed it. What would be the reason for that? Why would some scribe want to go and remove this and try to get it out of there? As you'll see, see in this passage, that could be a theory, because Jesus takes too lenient, they believe, a lenient of a, of a, a view on um, adultery. Could be. But if that's the case, if so, why did, Jesus leave the, or why did they leave the account of Jesus with the Samaritan woman? Right? That woman was also guilty of sexual immorality. And his um, rebuke to her was less direct, far more lenient than this woman. So... I don't know if that's really the case. 
So what do you conclude about this? Well, this is what you conclude. The story is likely a story. Part of not, not the original text of John's gospel, but a piece of history, a piece of oral tradition that was passed down. Uh, if you remember in John chapter 21, verse 25, he says this, there are also many other things that Jesus did, right, which they were written. You know, you couldn't contain them if you wrote them all in the books, right? Well, this is probably one of those many other things that Jesus did. It's an actual historical event from Christ's life. You might be asking then, well, why is it placed here? Why do we even find it here in, in this place of John if it doesn't seem to fit, if it breaks the context and all of that? Well, I think there might be two verses in chapter 8 uh, that led people to put it here, and I'll point them out to you real quick here. Verse 15, Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. As you'll see as we go through the passage, it's, it is a matter of judging this woman's sin and condemning her, uh, sen sentencing her to, to death. And Jesus says here in verse 15, he judges no one. And then later in verse 46, he says, which of you convicts me of sin? So there is sort of that context there, and perhaps that's why it was, uh, why it was put here. Regardless, here's the question you're asking. <laughs> well, how, how do we handle a text like this? I mean, what, what are we talking about? What, what should our response be? Should you all right now just rip that out of your Bibles? Is that what you should do? Is that your response to it? No, that's not your response. And the reason is this, the text contains no teaching that contradicts the rest of Scripture, and it also paints a beautiful picture of Jesus that's consistent with the portrait of Jesus that we see in Scripture. However, and I will say this, when you come to a passage uh, like this, you have to be careful of forming a doctrine of belief that's based solely upon this passage. Some people, if you conclude from this passage, as I've heard people do, that Jesus does not judge sin, then you have formed an inaccurate conclusion that contradicts the rest of Scripture. So what we're going to do is today we're going to read this passage. We're going to see the picture of Jesus that's presented here with this little piece of, of history. And I think you'll see that it's consistent doctrinally with the rest of Scripture. And I think you'll see it's consistent with the Christology of Jesus, the study of Jesus, as you see in the rest of Scripture um, as well. Uh, be, before we do that, just one s side note here. Unless I've shaken anyone's faith in the inerrancy of Scripture, we believe the, in the inerrancy of Scripture. And inerrancy means um, without error in its doctrine and teaching. That's what we're looking for. Of course, because we're dealing with such an old manuscript, there are textual errors. But here's the great thing. We have so many thousands of copies of them, the New Testament in particular, we have over 20,000 copies. We have more copies of the New Testament, Old Testament, uh, New Testament and Old Testament than we do of any other document of antiquity. We have, we have them in such an abundance that when you compare one little textual um, mistake with what it says in another copy, we're able to determine what it says. And in fact, I think it was Josh McDowell that had done a little illustration to explain it really uh, uh, cleverly. Uh, but he does a little, like, little, little, little note that says, uh, well, it clearly says to your human eye, you have won a million dollars. But the O in million is missing as their hashtag instead. The U in U is missing, and there's an exclamation mark instead. And he says, now, which one of you would not be the first one down to the line to, like, claim your million, million dollars, right? He says, you compare that with the other manuscript. Now, this one is missing the I, but it has the O. Oh, this one's missing the, the, the L, but it has the U. And so because we have so many copies, we're able to determine – uh, exactly what is meant. But there are passages like this that seem to jump around. Like I mentioned, Mark is one of them here. We have this account as well. Don't let it rock you. Don't let it shake you. Um, we include it because we see um, the Jesus of Scripture and we see um, the doctrine of Scripture. So let's read the passage today, starting in verse 53. And everyone went to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in their midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. 
So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this, uh, this little piece of history, a little glimpse of one of those many things that you've done. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to see, see you in this passage, the Jesus of Scripture, that we see that this little section is consistent doctrinally with what your word teaches, Lord, and help us to apply what we find in here today. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's just back up and look at verse 53 uh, to 8, 2, one more time. And everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. <clears throat> now, since we began by disputing the authenticity of this text as being from John, we don't really know where it fits chronologically. You know, I've been taking care to tell you, here's how much time has passed, right? There's six months between chapter six and chapter seven. I've been trying to keep you on track here. We really don't know chronologically where this fits because we don't believe it fits in the gospel of John. So we don't know in terms of the life and ministry of Jesus. However, these verses very closely parallel Luke 21, 37 to 38. And that's the, the passage of Luke that I mentioned that some manuscripts place this account after. So here's Luke 21, 37 to 38. I have it for you. It says this, and in the daytime he was teaching in the temple but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. So it's very similar to that. And Luke's account here takes place during the Passion Week. So whenever this took place, Jesus was evidently in Jerusalem because when everyone went to his own house, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is east and adjacent to uh, Jerusalem. And Jesus either slept on the mountainside or he stayed at the home of Martha, Mary, and uh, Lazarus. Lazarus, because they're in Bethany, which is on the eastern slope of, of the mount. And then in verse 2, we're told that he returns to the temple complex, and he begins a teaching. Very simple, right? There's no fanfare. There's no gimmicks. Uh, the crowds are just drawn to him because of his power, uh, the power of his teaching, not to, uh, because of self-promotion. And just as I begin to look at this, I already see the Jesus of Scripture. These verses are consistent with what Scripture teaches about the humility of Jesus, doesn't it? Because Jesus doesn't go blasting into the temple, declaring all these things. He just taught that Jesus sleeps on the Mount of Olives. And I think of uh, what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. But that Jesus made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And I think sometimes we just forget, yes, Jesus lived a humble life, but the biggest moment of humility was him when he chose to become a man. We, we certainly look at man as the, the, the ultimate species, don't we, right? We're at the top of the food chain. We're doing pretty good. But for Jesus to come become a man, that was a step down. That was humility. And it began there. And then you think about his birth, right? We're about to celebrate his birth as we come up to Christmas. And Luke chapter 2, verse 7 there's not a lot about his birth. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, we know there was some, a little bit of fanfare because there were some angels, right? There was a star. But some of those things just went to some very sp specific groups of people. But Jesus was born in a barn. He was laid in a, a food trough for animals. So certainly a, a humble beginning. And then Matthew chapter 8, verse 20 tells us that Jesus, um, that Jesus had nowhere to lay his head, right? Foxes in, have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And here Jesus just goes up to the Mount of Olives, spends the night, walks into Jerusalem and begins teaching. I see the Jesus of Scripture already. And then we come to the event. Look at verses 3 to 5. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? So 
so Jesus is teaching. It's interrupted by scribes and Pharisees. Remember, scribes are also sometimes called lawyers. They're the experts in the law. And sometimes they're, they're Pharisees as well. The Pharisees, along with Sadducees, Zealots, and Essenes, were part of the four you know, main religious sects that have existed there in first century uh, Judaism. But the Pharisees also um, were, were strict adherents to the Mosaic law, and they were the dominant religious influence among the Jewish uh, people, even though they were, they, were, they were the smallest. So here you have the, the, the group that's dedicated to the law of Moses, the group that's the, the experts to the law of Moses, coming to Jesus with a woman caught in adultery. Now, their hostility to Jesus here in this passage, uh, it's certainly consistent with the hostility to Jesus in John's gospel. We've seen that thus far. That's already begun. So they interrupt Jesus' teaching to bring this adulteress before him, and they claim that she's guilty because she's caught in the act. Now, um, that is true. Scripture says scribes and Pharisees in this passage here, and according to Scripture, Deuteronomy 19.50, that's enough to establish a matter. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. They have not come to Jesus to establish the matter. It's been established. She is guilty. She's caught in the act, and it's done. So they're not here to question her guilt. They're not even here to question the penalty. Just note that. They know the penalty as well. They've said what it was. What they said about Moses' law, right, about stoning, that, that is accurate. Moses records in the Ten Commandments, you know, in, in Exodus 20, uh, the Ten Commandments there, the Seventh Commandment, you shall not commit adultery, but the death penalty prescribed for adultery is found in Leviticus 20, verse 10. And this is what it says, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. So they know that she's guilty. They know what the penalty is. But doesn't it make you wonder, why are they there? Why have they brought this woman to Jesus? Jesus isn't a judge. He isn't a member of the Sanhedrin. They can just go try her in the courts, and it's done. Look at verse 6. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. They aren't seeking justice. It's not what they are after. They, they were, they would have tried, tried her, like I said. There's not any legal difficulty in this case. It's pretty much open and shut. She's caught in the act. So what do they want from Jesus? The law of the Moses, right, has been broken. One of the guilty parties apprehended. We don't, don't know what happened to the man. But here's the thing. They want something way more than justice here. They want Jesus. They want to trap him. And they thought they had him in the uh, proverbial rock in a hard place, right? What's he going to do? What will Jesus say? If Jesus objects to stoning her, then he's going to be guilty of going against the Mosaic law, and that will, will pretty much take him out of the running for the Messiah. If he agrees with his accusers, off with her head, right? What will his relationship with the people be like after that point? Will lose favor with people in terms of the reputation he has as one who had compassion for sinners? That would be destroyed as well. They think they've got him. But I think there's a deeper theological issue here as well. How do divine justice and divine mercy harmonize? Right? The woman's guilty, and she is. God is holy, and his law is holy. And the law brings about wrath, Romans tells us. In Romans 2.12, we're told this, For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. The law brings judgment. The law brings wrath. There is no forgiveness with the law. So the question has always been, how does God forgive sinners without violating the law, right? What is the answer to that? Well, the answer is standing before the woman. And he doesn't respond. He simply stoops down. And he begins to write in the sand. Look at the second half of verse 6. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. I like that. He just goes about doodling in the sand. Uh, as if he didn't even hear them. 
Now, to think about this. Get the picture. He's in the temple. They're not alone. The temple's always crowded. There's lots of people around. He's teaching. He's speaking. And all of a sudden, this big commotion comes up. These scribes, these Pharisees come dragging this woman in, probably full of tears, right? Commo- commotion. And like, this woman's been caught. You know, and this is the penalty. What do you think we should do? Go about my doodle here. Quite a response. Now, many suggestions have been made as to what Jesus was meaning by his actions or maybe what he wrote. Some say he was acting out something. Some say he was acting out Jeremiah 17, 13. Jeremiah 17, 13 says this, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Now, I like that. Sounds great. Jesus just said to come to him and and drink, and some fountain of of waters will be in you. And then these guys come up and and accuse her, and he starts writing in in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord. Those people aren't there to honor the Lord. They're not there for justice. They're there for him. They have sinful hearts, sinful motives. Sure. Some suggest he wrote Exodus 23.1. You shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Their motives are unrighteous. Some think, oh, he just wrote out Exodus 23.1. Others suggest that he wrote the words that he would say in verse 7. He who is without sin among you, let him throw at first a, a stone. Could, could be that as well. Probably the most popular view, the one I've heard the most, and, and probably uh, you as well, is that he stooped down and began to list the sins of the woman's accuser. So rather than what they're accusing her of, he begins to look at the room and, and write their names and what they've done. Jim, I'll put your sin on you. Ryan Bercy, I'll put your sin on you. James Valdiva, Austin Bachman, sin on you. Just kidding. I could see that impact. I could see what that would do. As they're there to to condemn this woman, he just, part of you would go, well, how does he know that, right? How does he know that? How does he know that? Now, while those sound good and make me go, oh, they're all just speculation. The passage doesn't say anything about it, which means it's unimportant. What is important is Jesus' response. Look at verses 7 to 8. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, I think Jesus' response here is absolutely masterful because he upheld the law, didn't he? He upheld it. In fact, he didn't deny the woman's guilt. He also affirmed the penalty for that sin. He affirmed the death penalty. Yeah, there's stoning involved in this, this uh, as well. So he, he doesn't deny either of those things. In addition, according to the law, those who were witnesses to the capital offense, they were supposed to be the ones to throw the stones first. In Deuteronomy 17, 7, the hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So you shall put away the evil from among you. So what Jesus essentially does here is he tells them themselves to carry out the execution. Yep, you're right. Right? Carry out the execution throw the stones first, but with one stipulation. Did you notice that? You had to be without sin. If you're without sin among you, go ahead and throw the stone. Now, what is Jesus asking for? Is he asking for sinless perfection to carry out capital punishment? Well, no, because then no capital punishment would have been carried out in the entire Old Testament because no one's without sin. It could be why people like the idea of Jesus writing their sins out in the sand there he's written it out here and they're convicted by the sins of their own hearts and their own lives and they now are faced with taking the life of someone else knowing their own sin and they turn and walk away I don't know I think Jesus does more though what he revealed to them was the fact that they are unfit judges and executioners because they're not here for justice they're not here for justice they're not here with righteous means We love God so much, and we love his law so much, and I just hate when God's law is broken. I want to see justice done. They have no concern that God's law has been broken, none. And Jesus sees that in their hearts. They just want Jesus to 
actually slipped through their net of deception, and now they're faced with having to carry out the death penalty. How would you like that? Yep, go ahead and throw the stone. Be the first one to do that. Watch out for all the blood splatter that's going to take place when you come to that moment. They're guilty of hypocrisy, and they know it. And that's what Jesus is confronting here, the not without sin. And it could be that some of the women's accusers were even themselves guilty of adultery, right? Just confronted with their heart. And Jesus' challenge always cut to the heart. It's the heart that we always have to address, right? Adultery, wrong? Absolutely. But where does it come from? It stems from the heart. We we, We forget. We always look at the actions. We look at behavior. We'll be talking about this today in the parenting class, actually. We get, especially at parents, We get attracted to the behavior because particularly in the toddler, right, behavior, how they're acting, alerts you to the fact that something is wrong, right? Like, that is not normal. (laughs) I need to do something. But we get focused on changing the behavior, and we don't focus on changing the heart. Do you notice that Jesus always goes to the heart? He never gets distracted. Has this woman committed adultery? Absolutely. Jesus doesn't say anything about it. He doesn't say anything about her sin at all. Instead, he goes, if you're without sin, go ahead. How is your heart? Because I'm pretty sure you're here to trap me. You just want to see someone killed, and it's not the woman. It cuts to the heart. The heart is what you have to attack, and Jesus always does it beautifully. And look what it does. Look at the response when you address the heart. Look at verse 9. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. The woman's accusers were convicted by their their consciences, and so they they leave. This challenge was too convicting. No one could stand there and throw that stone. Now, what is your conscience? You talk about the conscience. What is that? Is that a little Jimmy Jimmy Cricket you keep in your pocket that goes along and seems a happy tune there? No. It's it's a God-given faculty. God has given it to you. And it alerts you as to what is right and and wrong. And we all have it. Every human being has a conscience. In Romans chapter 2, verses 14 to 15, we're told this. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. To show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So you have Gentile people who don't know the law but still have some sense of right or wrong, right? Some kind of moral fabric in their being. It's written on their hearts. Their consciences alert them to the fact that they're doing wrong. That comes from God. And Paul refers to the conscience as a witness. It testifies of the truth that's written on every human heart. And you can go against your conscience. You can. You can reject the warning, and you can sin. And when you do it often enough, you sear it, as is the hot iron, Paul says. You actually sever those nerves. You deaden them so they no longer function in the way they're written to do it. They no longer alert you to the fact that you're doing wrong. The conscience of these accusers convicts them. None of them are, are fit to judge her. He exposes their hypocrisy. And the oldest ones leave first. I think that's interesting, probably due to wisdom, actually. They're wise enough to recognize their sin in the hearts and, and, and their lives and to be the ones to go first. But pretty soon, only Jesus and the woman are left. Now, I don't think they're alone alone. They're in the temple. There's people around. But I think in terms of the accusers having gone, it's just Jesus and, and her because of what Jesus says here in verse 10. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? This is great because, remember, she was, she was condemned by the accusation of those witnesses, right? The matter has been established, but now those witnesses are gone. So because they have left, the legal case against the woman has been dropped. They're no longer there. And if you notice, this is the first time in the passage anyone has addressed the woman, right? Jesus does it. He calls her woman, <laughs> which was a respectful form of address. He used it of his mother in John chapter 2. Do you recall that? just says, has no one condemned you? She says, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. 
Now, what has Jesus done here? What have we learned from his encounter with this, this woman? What was Jesus' opinion of adultery? Was Jesus too lenient on that? Did he think it was okay? I've heard all kinds of spins of this. Well, we don't want to forget other passages of Scripture, right? In Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 28, he says this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He does acknowledge the fact that adultery is there, but he says what's worse is that if you've looked and you've lusted in your heart, you've already done it. It's the heart that he attacks. It's the heart that's the problem. So Jesus not only saw physical adultery as sin, but he saw heart adultery as sin. And that is the issue. The, the heart, the will, the mind, the emotions, the, it, that's what drives us. We go after what our heart desires. So it's not so much that there's a pretty woman or a handsome man or whatever. It's the heart is the issue. So did the woman sin? Yes. And Jesus said that she did. He called it sin. Go and sin no more. Was the woman wrong? Is adultery wrong? Yes, he told her not to do it again. He rebuked sin. How people miss these things in this passage, I really don't know. But it's clear that it's sin. It's clear that he told her not to do it again. But he also gave the woman hope. He gave her hope for a new life, just like he did with the woman at the well. Right? You're right. You've had many husbands. You've been in this cycle of trying to pursue these things of your life, the, these things that you think will fill the empty hole in your life. See, this is a woman in the same kind of situation. He gives her hope for a new life. And that's okay. Was what Jesus did here wrong? No. Remember how I brought the question earlier, how God can forgive sinners and yet also, you know, not violate the law? That is answered in one person. It's Jesus. The answer to that lifelong question is Christ. In Jesus Christ, divine justice, the law, and mercy, forgiveness, they harmonize. They come together because his sacrificial death paid the penalty for the sins of all who believe in him. God could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, the golden name of Jesus Christ. But in Psalm 8510, I have this one for you. I love this picture. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have stood. Mercy and truth. The truth of the law is still uphold. It's upheld. There's sin. That was the sin committed. But mercy was shown there. Forgiveness was granted. And I know what some of you are thinking. I'm saying these things come together in Jesus, and I've just talked about him on the cross, and some of you might be thinking, but Jesus hasn't died on the cross for her sins. That hasn't happened yet. we got six months to go yet. How can Jesus forgive her sins? Are you ready for this? He's already died on the cross. Revelation 13, 1. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life. That refers to people on the earth worshiping the Antichrist. So, all who have not been, bit, written, been written in the book of life are the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus is the Lamb. And Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. Yes, mind blown. Yes, absolutely. We're talking about a, a God that exists outside of time and plans and purposes going forth. How does that work? Well, it's true in a prophetic sense. We know verses like Isaiah 53, 5 to 6, okay? Just look at, look at how it says this. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. Those things have happened, although in Isaiah's time, they hadn't. They hadn't happened, but they've happened. It's in a prophetic sense, but also it's in an application sense. We can apply those things to you. Verse 6, and by his stripes we are healed. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Prophetic sense, that is going to take place and it has happened, and you can apply that to your life now. How does that, how does that work? What I'm saying is all throughout redemptive history, all who were forgiven and given eternal life, they had the future sacrifice of Jesus applied to their sins. And so Jesus is standing before the woman, guilty of adultery, and he doesn't condemn her. 
doesn't condemn us. In John chapter 3, verse 17, he tells us, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Remember, the world is already condemned. The Father has condemned it. It's condemned. But Jesus is sent in not to condemn, but to save. He's there to save. And in a very real sense, if that woman left that day believing in her, believing in Christ, that she actually can be forgiven of sins like he did that day, I believe we'll see her in heaven, even though Jesus hadn't died on the cross. So the future blood of Jesus applied throughout redemptive history. That's how, that's how it has to happen. It, our human minds don't get it. We say, no, this happens at this time, and then this happens at this time, and this can't be applied to this time. Did God not create time? He did. Don't get stuck in time. God is time. So the woman went away able, able to live a life of righteousness if she believed and if she repented. If she believed in him as the one who came to save her and to not condemn her. We don't know what she did. We don't know. But she was about to face the death penalty, right? Because the wages of sin is death. But she was pardoned for her sin, for by grace you have been saved. We all, we all had a death penalty. We were born with a death penalty. You had one future, death. You were pardoned for your sin by the blood of Jesus. And so she was able to live for sin no more because she was healed by his stripes that were yet to be. Peter writes this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Jesus took our sins in his own body on the tree, and we have died to sins, and now we can live for righteousness. And I, I think Peter writing that was influenced by Isaiah 53, by the stripes we were healed. I think he saw that application being very real and very present. And Jesus was able to apply it to this woman. I don't condemn you anymore. But go and sin no more. I see the Jesus of Scripture in this passage. I see consistence here in the passage with other uh, doctrine of Scripture. Sin is sin. God will judge sin. But he sent the one to free us from our sin. Jesus died for sin. And he died for sin in eternity past. Because God had planned and predetermined that to be. So as you can see, far from a spurious and contentious text, that we, we find here in a historical account that I think paints a marvelous picture of Jesus, the grace that he offers, but I think it's consistent with the teaching of Scripture. And what we should do is we should be grateful for God's sovereignty in preserving us. I think sometimes we go to these things, I don't, I can't believe that's not Scripture. We shouldn't have that. God, God has preserved it. It's here, and we can learn from it. The area that we, to be, we have to be careful in is what I started with. Some people go and they make an entire doctrine out of one particular set of Scripture, which you should never do with any Scripture. Especially, though, with a piece that is sort of questionable in terms of who's written it and where it should be. So today, though, I just want to remind you what Jesus has done here in the lives of these Pharisees and the lives of the woman. A lot of times we, we list all the big sins, adultery, I mean, you know, one of those, murder, right, whatever it is. And we, we, we look with those hypocritical hearts just like the Pharisees did and say, that's wicked, sinful people, right? I can't believe they commit those sins, all the while quite happy with our hypocritical hearts, attitudes of complaining, malicious gossip, slander. See, we put those on a different level, but God hates those things as well. Jesus confronted the hypocrisy of the heart of these, these are the Pharisees, they knew the law, they just wanted Jesus dead. Let's be people today that don't have hypocritical hearts. Don't be super judgmental of where people are. You know, people sin because they're sinners. Honestly, right? We can't help it. We were at the rugby game last night. There were 64,000 such people, right, in the stands, right, pouring out of the pubs. Steve and I, Steve Vickery was with me. Um, we were walking by one pub actually called Beelzebub. That's what it's called. And we both kind of laughed and said, oh, that's an interesting name for a pub. He go <laughs> and he jokingly said, well, at least they're being honest about it, right? We know exactly what's going on in there, right? It says Beelzebub, crafty devil. Like, well, okay. So clearly we know, we know what they're about, right? Just get a bunch of people drunk and hooked on alcohol. 
But you could be in a situation like that and go, oh, wow, I can't believe he's, you know. And then at the same time, you know, I could, I could be harsher to my wife. God does not please with that, right? I can have impure thoughts. God is not pleased with that. I could be into complaining, right? Just a heart of complaining, not gratitude, like we saw last week. Wasn't that, wasn't that refreshing? It was so beautiful to hear all of your hearts of gratitude. But let's be without hypocrisy, and let's draw upon the grace and forgiveness that is rightfully yours in the blood of Jesus. God, thank you so much for this time uh, today, Lord, for the opportunity to study this interesting uh, text, Lord. And, Lord, you, you, you know where it's from. You know why it's here. We just trust your sovereignty in all things here. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to, to, to read it and to study it and to see that this is consistent with what your word teaches us. We know that um, you do condemn hypocrisy. We know that you do condemn sin. But we also know that you are a God of grace. We all have received forgiveness of sins, not because we've earned it, but because you're a gracious God. Lord, help us to be gracious people, Lord, and act in grace toward others. Lord, thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing one more song.